Okay, we'll make a start now. Hello everyone and welcome to the State of the Nation 2021. It's so great to see so many of you here and so many people have registered. We're really excited to share with you the findings of this year's report. Before I hand over to my colleagues, Harris and Harday, I just wanna go through a few quick housekeepings. We've got a hashtag today. So please, if you're on social media, use the hashtag SOTN. Um, it will come up on the screen as well during the slide. So yeah, it'd be really great to see so many of you sharing and tweeting, that'd be really great. Another thing is um, the event is to do to be an hour. So we'll have about half an hour for presentation and half an hour for questions. So we should be finishing at five o'clock. And if you'd like to submit a question, you can do on the question box. It's really important that you put it into the question box because if you put it into the chat box, I might not see it. So any questions you have during the presentation or after, please put it into the chat box, into the question box, sorry, and I'll be able to read them out at the end. And then finally, if you do have any technical difficulties or if you can't hear me at any point, please just message me onto the chat and we'll get that sorted for you. Right, now without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Keris for our introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Tizzy. Thanks for kicking us off. And um, we really appreciate everyone joining us today. It's fantastic to see so many people interested in our State of the Nations um, report. This is a really important part of our uh, calendar at Quarateg. And um, this being the third year that we've run the State of the Nations report, really great to see that people are kind of looking out for it year on year. And um, hopefully that we can start together to, to monitor progress against some of these key indicators. I'm going to ask Carde if you can start the slides um, for us before I go on. Uh, thanks, Carde. So I hope everybody is keeping well and um, keeping motivated and, and sane during this really difficult year um, that we were all experiencing. We know that the temptation for both us as individuals, but also for policymakers, can be to focus certainly on individuals and our collective health and, uh, and well-being. But we've seen that this report lays bare, as you'll soon find out, um, that the impact of COVID-19 on inequality has been absolutely massive. So I just want to um, sort of restate the importance of us not losing momentum on focusing on equality just because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. In fact, you know, as we say in the report, um, and, and as you will see, we believe that now is the time that we need to increase our emphasis to, to change outcomes for the better in the post-COVID uh, world. I just want to say very briefly again at the outset, thank you to the team who've worked incredibly hard on this report, and I think it's testament to the, their skills um, that we've got such a high quality piece of research to share with you today. So, as I said, this is the third year that we've run State of the Nations um, report and published it on the same day. It's really important to us and it's something that we have felt um, was lacking uh, prior to this report's existence uh, because we talk often too frequently in warm ways about equality and the need for fairness and social justice. And, we don't always find the robust indicators to measure and actually hold people accountable for their action or otherwise um, towards implementing um, greater equality in, in Wales. So we wanted to, to look at ways that we could measure progress in Wales. Um, and I'll um, outline in a minute a bit how we frame that and, and why. Um, but, it's, we will continue to do this and we'll continue to do it and be unashamed about um, highlighting where action falls short. Um, and I think that's the, one of the crucial ways that we can talk truth to power. So if you want to um, move us on, Hardy, if you don't mind. And I just want to frame this, obviously, in the context of, of COVID-19. We, we know that COVID has changed everything. Uh, for us this year, for the way that we live, the way that we work, how we socialise or don't socialise with people. But of course, COVID 19's hit some groups um, much harder than others, and particularly hardest hit include women, also people of colour, people on low incomes, young people. 
and, and you will see that start to emerge um, through the data this year, but more likely to see um, a, a significant impact in, in the results next year. So it's really important that we understand um, those impacts both now in the measures that we, we look at today and in this report, but from here onwards through all the work that we do and, and you all do in your organisations. Many individuals will have experienced life-changing impacts from COVID because of bereavement, job losses, anxiety, social isolation, or, or many more. And, and these are going to continue to affect our lives for certainly many years to come, if not um, forever. So our State of the Nation report looks at the experience of women in work and the economy, uh, of poverty, of social isolation, and hardship, as well as women's experience of harassment, abuse, and violence. And it monitors who holds power in Wales and who represents us. So the slide on the screen is the three strategic priorities of Horiteg, um, and that's how we've framed our, our research. And overall, it highlights the, the impact of um, the deep-rooted inequalities in our society that are absolutely entrenched, as we know, and these have been exposed further and exacerbated by COVID-19 and show the need for them to be tackled at the root cause um, and, and further highlight why warm words are not enough when it comes to tackling things like gender inequality and, and we need more robust action. But these three areas are really important to us. They provide us an understanding of the range of inequality across the breadth of the economy and society. Uh, women's experiences in the economy, our different experiences, how we're represented or, or not, our positions in the labour market, and, and all of those things that leave us at greater risk of abuse, of financial hardship, of poverty and social isolation. If we don't take action against all three of these areas, then we won't see the progress that we need to see. So this year's report has been overshadowed to some extent by COVID-19. And we know that there's no singular female or woman's experience of COVID-19, but it's cru more crucial, we think, than ever to continue to monitor against these indicators so that we can pinpoint where we're falling behind or not making uh, change at the pace that we need to see it. So um, at this point, without um, risking stealing any of Harde's thunder, because she's done the analysis and the important work here for us, I'm going to hand over to my very esteemed colleague, Dr. Hardy Turkman, to, to run us through the key findings this year. Thank you, Kiris. So, um, hiya. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm Hade, a research partner at Coretech, and I will briefly present you some of the key figures of our report today. Um, so the report contains, as Kerry said, three ma main sections, uh, the core text focuses in, in, in three main sections, women in the economy, women represented and women at risk. Uh, in the women in the economy section, we look at economic activity, unemployment and economic inactivity levels, intersectionality, gender pay gap, self-employment and working patterns. Uh, in the women represented part, we look at Welsh politics, local government, public life, and sectors and occupation in, in Wales. And um, in women at risk part, we are looking to sexual harassment and domestic violence against women and um, poverty and social security. And this is one of the most challenging part because we know that unfortunately the, this list can be extended, but uh, due to the lack of data and um, the focus of core tech at the moment, we, we uh, kind of um, limit the uh, limit the focus of this section with these uh, three main topics. Um, before we move on to the figures, I would like to quickly mention about the data set we use in the reports. First of all, in order to achieve continuity of the data over the years, which would allow us to make comparison later, we try to use official statistics through Office for National Statistics, Stat Wales and Welsh Government uh, publications. Um, in the women represented and women at risk parts, though, uh, we also reference to reports of some other um, governmental and non-governmental organizations uh, uh, reports who are mostly producing annual reports, um, such as Commissioner for Public Appointments, Plan UK, Welsh Women's Aid, and so on. 
in some parts data still remain challenging uh, in our report as they are either lack of gender and, and gender or uh, geographical breakdowns. Uh, for example, um, crime survey have limited well segregated data or the poverty statistics have still a household uh, measure rather than an individual focused effort. So uh, these are um, still um, remain remaining as challenges for us to make the analysis. But um, these challenges should not let us underestimate the incredible efforts of staff members working in the statistical departments. Um, and in front of you, I would like to thank them uh, for their efforts to produce robust data and their support for us um, accessing and understanding the data. So um, you will see that our report kicks off with intersectionality before giving a general picture in Wales. Um, intersectionality is key for understanding the inequalities of our societies. By intersectionality, we mean recognizing the way in which power structures interact with one another and create inequalities, discrimination and oppression. It's about understanding the way in which characteristics such as gender, race, sexuality, disability, class, age and fame can interact and produce unique and often multiple experiences and disadvantage. Unfortunately, it is not possible to analyze every topic in this report through an intersectional lens due to the lack of data. The volume of data being published covering, covering intersectional approach has increased over the years, and particularly the COVID-19 crisis showed us how important the data and intersectional lens is, but we have still a long way to go to achieve proper intersectional data. Uh, on the left, uh, you see the this year's disability and economic activity data that um, um, in this graphic you can see that there is slight increase in the economic activity of disabled women compared to the last year with 1.1 percent whereas there is a slight decrease in disabled men's economic activity with 0.8 percent likewise disabled women's economic inactivity and unemployment rate slightly dropped whereas disabled men's economic inactivity rates increased and unemployment rates decreased. This data uh, doesn't reflect the impact of the pandemic fully, and it is hard to draw conclusions regarding the consequences of it yet. But one positive thing happened due to the pandemic, if there is any, of course, has been the increase in flexible working. Working from home has, in some cases, improved the working lives of women with impairments and long-term health conditions and removed previous barriers they faced in their employment. We hope this challenge will last long and improve as we can see the positive impact of it on gender equality. And uh, on, the graphic, um, on, the, uh, on the graphic on the right, um, you can see the ethnicity and employment figures. Uh, purple bars are white women and green bars are BAME women's uh, figures. This figure uh, shows that uh, more BAME uh, people are in, in employment com compared to last year, even though COVID had an abhorrent impact on labor market. The rate uh, of the rise in employment figures are higher for the BAME people. The rise in employment for BAME men is 4.3%, whereas it is 0.8% for white men, and it is 1.1% for white women and 2.6% for BAME women. This might be related to the occupations and sectors that BAME people are working, and they are more likely to be working in frontline force, workforce. Yet there is still a big ethnicity gap between white and BAME women. Ethnic minority women are 14% more likely to be economically inactive than white women. Um, and um, with this slide, we started the main part of women in the economy. Um, as you know, gender pay gap is probably the, one of the most discussed data uh, with regards to gender equality in the economy. Uh, the gender pay gap in Wales for 2020 is 11.6%, a drop of 2.9% from 2019, uh, 2019's figure. It's promising that the gender pay gap has shrunk in Wales this year. Um, these figures uh, show that there are significant differences among local authorities. You can see the, um, uh, on the, um, the graphic on the left that uh, there's a huge difference fluctuation 
um, among the local authorities. 11 local authorities have higher gender pay gap than the national average. Torwan has the highest gender pay gap with 27.7%. Perdigon has the lowest gender pay gap with a negative uh, pay gap uh, minus 13.5%. And there are four local um, authorities demonstrating negative gender pay gap in 2020, whereas there were only two local authorities with negative gender pay gap last year. Um, it is important to bear in mind that we are experiencing un unprecedented times and our economy and labor market have been massively affected by the pandemic. Given the rapid changes occurring in, in economic structures and the labor market due to the pandemic, it is hard to interpret the reasons of the substantial fluctuation among the figures at the moment. Uh, and um, if the trends evident in, in the uh, gender pay gap at the local level over the time. The ongoing uh, impact of the pandemic and local economies and the labor market should be carefully considered when we are looking to the gender pay gap. Um, now you can see the economic activity rates of men and women. The economic activity rate of uh, men aged 16 to 64 is, um, stands for 80.5%. Uh, whereas women is 73.4%. Compared to last year, women's economic activity has uh, risen almost 1%, whereas men's remain the same. Um, at this point, we should also mention that the economic activity rates vary by age, and we see a more significant gender, pay, uh, gender gap and change from last year when the figures bro broke, um, break down by age. For example, uh, there's a significant drop in, in the economic activities of women age 16 to 19, whilst the economic activity of men uh, of this age increased 1.1%. Similarly, there is a significant fall in the economic activity of both men and women aged 20 to 24. These two age groups are more likely to work in temporary precarious work, which might be falling into the closed sectors due to pandemic. Uh, and we know that young people's employment has been affected due to the COVID-19 crisis and the Figures reflects uh, figures might be reflecting this. Uh, unlike the fall in the economic activity of younger age groups, the economic activity of women aged 25 to 34 increased in 2020, uh, while economic activity of men fell slightly. This might be also related to the sectors that women in this age group works, uh, which are likely to be the um, key and critical sectors, such as health and social care and education. If you look at economic inactivity rates of men and women, we see that almost 27% of women are economically inactive, uh, meaning that they are not um, uh, working uh, and looking for a job, whereas it is almost 20% um, for men. Um, the graphic in, on the slide shows the reasons of economic inactivity. And these graphic really stark gender differences, as you can see. Um, even though the reason for or the reason of looking after family and home fell 2% from last year for women, still 26% of women are economically inactive because of looking after their family, family and home, whereas this is the reason for only 6.5% of men. And uh, last but not least, uh, we also see that women's unemployment rate remains same with 3.5% uh, this year whereas men's unemployment rate has dropped 1.3% to 3.8%. And um, before going to, uh, moving to the other slide, I just want to um, quickly remind that these figures are quite volatile still, uh, still due to the rapid changes in the labor market. And uh, these figures covers both pre-COVID and post-COVID times up, um, by, up, up, by up to July 2020. And we still uh, we uh, we will see the full impact of COVID-19 on these figures in the coming days. And we also look at the self-employment figures in our report. We don't observe any significant change in the uh, self-employment of women and men. 16.9% uh, of men who are in employment are self-employed, uh, whereas only 8.8% women are self-employed. However, we should underline that self-employed people are one of the group, groups hit hardest during um, 
COVID-19 crisis. So the next year's figures will show the impact of the um, um, COVID-19 uh, more clearly to us. Uh, in this um, part, uh, I also want to um, give some figures about the self-employment income support scheme. Uh, in Wales, we will make up the 30% of those eligible for this scheme and the take-up rate for women was uh, 62%, whereas the take-up rate for men is uh, 68%. The average grant uh, value was also higher for men at um, uh, £2,000 compared to women at £1,900. Um, working patterns are another topic that we focus on in our report. As we know that almost 80% of the available part-time jobs are held by women and there is a significant part-time working penalty. While 40.1% 40 of women are working part-time, only 11.8% of men are working part-time. Yet this year, we see a significant change between the figures of different age groups again. The figures shows that more young men population took up uh, took up part-time working whereas more women aged 20 to 24 work full-time compared to last year take up of part-time work for men uh, aged 16 to 24 increased 5.5 percent whereas for women aged 16 to 24 it fell 3.6 percent these figures might be also a sign of the changes in the labor market uh, due to the COVID-19 So um, and this is the second section of um, our report. Uh, in relation to politics, we see little change from last year's figures, which is understandable given the electro electoral cycles. With Senate elections due to take place in May 2021, candidates' um, selection is important if we are uh, if we are to secure gender balance in Senate once more. Early signs suggest that while some parties have taken action to ensure balanced candidates late. Women and ethnic minority candidates continue to be underrepresented across the board. Uh, when we look at the representation of women in Welsh politics, we see 48% of MSs, 29% of local councillors, 35% of Welsh MPs, and 57% uh, of Welsh government cabinet members are women. Um, and the, another important area to look in, in, in with regards to uh, women's representation in politics is the local authorities to measure the women's representation. Uh, local authority elections in uh, 2020 will give a further opportunity to shift the dial and serious, cons uh, serious consideration should be given by political parties as to how they can deliver candidate slates that better represent the communities that they serve. If we look at the current women's representation in local governments, we see 23% of council leaders and 36% uh, of council chief executives are women, which are still quite low. Um, in relation to public appointments, we see a quite dramatic drop in the proportion of women appointed this year. Uh, this will need to be closely monitored to ensure that it is not an indicative of a trend. There has been a modest increase in the proportion of people from ethnic minorities securing appointments, but the figure, figure for female chair appointments this year is woefully low. Looking in detail, 43% of public appointments made in 2019-2020 were female, and it was 64% um, last year. Less than 5% of chair appointments in 2019-2020 were female, and it was 56% last year, and 7.7% of public appointments made in 2019-2020 were BAME, and this was positively increased, and um, 3%, uh, it was 3% uh, last year, but this data is not gender segregated, so um, it, it covers all the BAME uh, appointments, this figure. In the women represented part, we also um, look at the um, Welsh sectors and occupations um, uh, by gender. This graphic shows the proportion of men and women in occupations. Uh, women make up uh, almost 40% of the senior occupations in Wales. Overall, only 8.2% of the women workforce in senior positions. 
uh, whereas 11.3% of the men workforce occupies these positions. Um, however, um, as the graphic shows, uh, on top, women are dominant in the professional occupations, holding 54.4% of the whole professional occupations. Um, and the 23.1% of the women workforce works in professional occupations, while 17.5% of the men workforce working in these occupations. Um, the significant gender gap in occupations are observed in the lower rank occupations. For example, women make up 75% of the administrative and secretarial occupations, 80% of caring, leisure and other services, 60% uh, of sale and customer service occupations and only 12% of the skilled trade or occupations. So um, these figures show that there are there is a significant gender segregation across sectors and occupations in Wales. Um, and the latest data show that women still dominate in health, uh, education and other services, while men dominate construction, manufacturing and ICT. This uh, sector of segregation is one of the clear signs of why women uh, were hit hard in COVID-19 crisis, as they are predominantly working in either key sectors or sectors to be told to close, such as retail and hospitality. Still, um, the figures reflect uh, reflects, uh, also some positive changes this year, uh, with an increase in the proportion of women in the agriculture, information and communication, and professional scientific and technical sectors. And um, with this slide, we are in the third section of the report, women at risk. Um, women continue to face greater risk of poverty, social isolation, sexual harassment, and domestic violence. The COVID-19 crisis has further increased existing risks and uh, created new ones. Women are overrepresented in frontline roles, leaving them at greater risk of infection. They are more likely to work in sectors that have been shut down, leaving them at risk of financial hardship, and they have largely shouldered the burden of homeschooling and additional care needs, leaving them at risk of falling out of the labor market and increasing the risk of mental health issues and decreased well-being. There are growing concerns about the number of sexual assaults and cases of domestic abuse unreported, falls in the conviction of rape and sexual assault cases due to the circumstances created by the COVID-19 crisis, and the uh, volume, of, uh, volume and the nature of abuse directed at women on social media. So the last year, 62% um, of all sexual offenses and 90% of all rape cases were committed against women. 3.5% uh, of women aged 16 to 59, which um, is approximately uh, 514,000 women, experienced some sort of sexual assault uh, in England and Wales. Minus 8% change from last year observed in the number of reported sexual offences cases against women. Um, 194,881 um, uh, uh, online and telephone helpline contacts handled by Rape Crisis Centre, a 5% increase compared to 2018 to 2019. And despite the lockdown and reduced time in public spaces, one in five girls aged 14 to 21 have experienced public sexual harassment. And during the lockdown, 28% of young women felt less safe in public spaces and 25% of girls experienced at least one form of abuse, bullying, bullying or sexual harassment online. Um, these are quite um, uh, green pictures still, even though we are locked in our houses. And um, unfortunately, to be locked on um, our houses uh, also um, gave rise to domestic violence cases. Um, figures show that last year, 77% of women aged 16 to 74 who were survivors of domestic abuse has experienced partner abuse or assault in England and Wales. And it is a 2% increase from last year. 16% of the all crimes recorded by police in Wales are domestic abuse related. Uh, 1,032 uh, cases, more cases of domestic abuse related 
crime recorded by the police compared to the last year in Wales. And 53% of all violence against women offences recorded by the police were flagged as domestic abuse related in Wales. 6,896 calls received by Bash Women's Aid Life Fear Free Helpline during April to June 2020, a surprising 14% drop from last year. It will be a speculation to guess the reason of this drop in the calls, but one likely scenario might be that people living with their perpetrators cannot make the call for help. And um, even though the numbers of calls received by Bash Women's Aid Life Fear Free observed a drop in demand, demand on support services increased. According to Bash Women's um, Aid figures, total number of survivors supported increased 29.3% compared to last year. Number of new referrals received an uh, increase 44.8%. Uh, number of survivors referred and engaged with services 36.7% 36, uh, 36 increased. And the, the biggest increase were observed in the community services, but there are uh, some significant falls observed in sexual violence support and refuge services. And the other important topic that we are looking at in the State of the Nation uh, report uh, and in this uh, women at risk category is poverty. Before starting, um, I should mention that uh, the figures from South Wales on poverty covers 2018 to 2019 data. So the impact of the um, COVID-19 uh, cannot be measured in this data. And still, uh, poverty rates in Wales remain high with 23% of households in Wales are living in relative income poverty. And uh, of course, uh, they're expected to rise throughout the pandemic. It will take the time to see the full impact of the pandemic on poverty figures probably, but we know that many families are struggling as a result of the current economic situation due to the, the job losses, reduced working hours, or because they have fallen through the cracks of COVID-19 support scheme. Women's risk of poverty is closely linked to their position in the labor, labor market and within households, which have been in turbulence during the pandemic. The workforces of many of the shutdown industries, such as hospitality and retail, are female dominated, meaning that women are more at risk of job losses and reduced hours or pay. And unfortunately, they, the data on poverty remain challenging as well, as uh, I mentioned in the beginning. Figures hide the picture of women's poverty as they are based on household measures of poverty. Through data continues to uh, show that being a single parent and uh, working part-time are risk factors of being in poverty, which are the situations that women are more likely to be in. And the graphic shows that single parent, single female, and single male households are consecutively at greater, greatest risk of poverty. Even though there is a 2% drop from uh, 2018, 42% of single parent households are at great, greatest risk of poverty in Wales. And it is estimated that 86% of single parent households in the UK are women. Last figures um, I would like to um, share with you from our report are about social security and welfare system. COVID-19 painfully and uh, but clearly showed that uh, social security system is vital for the whole society and the economy. As the UK moved into lockdown, the need for financial supports increased, while schemes such as furlough scheme have been implemented specifically to respond to crisis, many people found themselves reliant on universal credit. While we see the proportion of women, uh, women university, uh, universal, uh, universal cre uh, credit climates reduced slightly from last year's figures, overall the number of people claiming uh, universal credit has risen massively, up 107% um, from 2019 with a larger increase in the number of men claiming universal credit. The biggest increase has seen in men claimants uh, of universal uh, credit who are in employment with 166%. Women claimants who are in work also increased 111%. 
In total, number of men claimants incre increased 126% and number of women claimants increased 93% in total compared to last year. And still, 52% uh, of universal credit claimants in Wales are women and universal credit claimants in Wales continue to be more likely to be in employment. 43% of women claimants are in work compared to 33% of men. So um, this is the last, last slide that um, um, I, uh, I, I will I'll share with you. And now I would like to hand it to Keris again to um, conclude the uh, report and also start the discussion. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have about the figures. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Hardy, and well done. We always give you the hardest of the jobs, and you've done a really thorough run through of some complex data. And I'm sure um, there'll be lots of questions uh, coming from from people who have joined us today. Just wanted to to run through a couple more things. Um, this, the theme of this year's report was what works, and I think it's a really important theme for this year, being an election year in in Wales. Um, we say all the time in Horateg to ourselves and to others, if we just keep doing the same things, we're going to get the same outcomes and these indicators won't change and won't change quickly enough over the coming years. So we've set out in our, our manifesto a clear set of uh, recommendations and asks to, to change um, the, those indicators and to increase the pace against them. So what works for us is a feminist economic recovery from COVID-19. We know from previous recessions, and there's likely to be some sort of uh, recession um, for, for some time to come after COVID-19. We know from previous recessions that women tend to, to fare worse. And given that we know that, let's learn from that previous experience and do something different. So we've set out what we think needs to happen in our feminist economic plan. And, and then in our manifesto, um, we ask for a clear commitment to delivering the recommendations set out in the gender equality review in full, um, so that we do get that fundamental shift in the way that Welsh government functions. Um, so not just in terms of how it develops policy, but how it absolutely implements them so that we get equality of outcome uh, for all women, and not just equality of opportunity. So we've just got a couple of slides um, to follow very briefly. There we go. So on, on, on women in the economy, um, just five key points really. Um, the need to invest in state infrastructure, including childcare, social care, healthcare and education. You know, I, women have had a, all of us, regardless of our experiences and our own personal circumstances, um, will know women working in these sectors, will know women caring for people, will know women uh, juggling homeschooling and working at the moment and I think now's the time and we think now's the time that we really need to value that care uh, that women do both as paid jobs in these industries but also the unfed care that many of us uh, do on a day-to-day -day basis in in the homes and in our communities. We think that we need sustainable multi-year funding for specialist equality organisations who can support the delivery of an inclusive economic strategy not just in terms of gender, but in terms of disability, in terms of sexuality, in terms of working with uh, people of colour and all sorts of different communities. So we need that sustainable funding. We um, have asked for the creation of a central hub of information for employers on modern working practices. Many of us have got used to home working, uh, whether we like it or loathe it over the last 12 months. Um, what we will say consistently is an organisation who've been advocating for agile working for, for decades is it's not just about giving people the, the access to the kit, to the mobile phone, to the laptop, um, to the office chair. It's about the culture of organisations and, and how we can create inclusive places of employment where, where everybody can achieve and prosper. Uh, we believe strongly that we need to deliver good quality childcare for children aged 0 to 4 for 48 weeks of the year. Um, I've often said and we've been arguing for a long time that the current, current childcare offer while financially um, as a whole package looks generous doesn't necessarily support people at the time they need to make those 
life-changing decisions that affect their long-term career and earnings potential. Uh, and then, as I said, uh, promoting agile working practices so that we can have autonomy over the way that we work and, and create that inclusive culture that we want to see in workplaces. And just to move me on, please. <laughs> and then are women represented? Um, we know that this is going to be the year that we uh, potentially see some changes for good or for ill in terms of the, the Senate uh, representation. And, and those of you who follow us on our um, social media and other ways will We'll see that we take a keen interest in, in the um, diversity of candidates selected by different parties, uh, candidates selected in winnable or, or non-winnable seats, and uh, all of that has a, a massive bearing on, on the overall figures of um, members of the Senate. Um, but we believe that there needs to be more radical reform, and Laura McAllister's report that was published um, probably over two years ago now called for an increase in the size of the Senate to 90 members and we believe that that is a key part of um, of improving the gender equality of those who represent us. And we know that where targeted schemes and specific schemes are in place to build the pipeline uh, and, and increase diversity, they work. Um, so we can't step away from those or take our foot off the gas. Um, and so we've mentioned here particularly Steps on Exec, which is a scheme that we run to give people the opportunity to gain that non-exec experience first and really successful mentoring schemes run by Women's Equality Network and, and EAST, uh, which are all about building the pipeline of people into public life in future. We believe there's more work to do on training careers advisors to identify and challenge gendered assumptions. Many of the stereotypes that um, find their way into our everyday life are deep-rooted at an early age. Um, and so we need to, to a key, in, key indicator that we've been looking at today around the gender pay gap. And um, one of the key contributors to that is that women and men work in very different sectors and industries. Uh, we value those sectors and industries very differently. We pay different rates of pay in them. And some of that stems from stereotypes in school, the choices that girls and boys make at a young age about the subjects and careers that they wish to pursue. I think we should move on. Finally, on women at risk. Um, and some pretty stark figures there that Harday presented as, as ever on sexual harassment. We need well specific data on sexual harassment to understand the extent of the problem so that we can monitor those trends more effectively, identify the key risk groups and improve prevention. Um, and also uh, some, some stark figures around um, uh, benefits. And so we, we, while a lot of social security is not devolved, there is work that could be done in Wales to reform existing Welsh benefits, whether that's free school meals, council tax reduction scheme, discretionary assistance fund, to at least expand eligibility and improve the take-up. And then lastly, we think um, there is the power to do this, to make misogyny a hate crime in Wales, to encourage reporting of incidents and enable better categorisation of crimes, so that we can really understand and address the scale of misogyny in our society. So um, you're probably sick of seeing our slides and I'm going to hand back to Chizzy to do um, the facilitation. Thank you very much Karis and Hardy. that was really really insightful and thank you to everyone um, for listening in and for the questions that are coming in. Um, please submit them in the question box if you have any but we've got a couple already. Um, the first one is from Meg Thomas from Disability Wales, who says, fantastic research, really interesting. Thank you, Meg. Um, her question is, what do you think we, um, why do you think we see more dra dramatic changes amongst disabled men rather than disabled women, especially in regards to unemployment? Harday, did you want to take that question? Yeah, I'm sure. Um of course, we don't know the um, reasons yet uh, properly, but um, as I said, uh, disabled women's employment increased compared to last year, but this figure covers uh, July 2019 to uh, June 2020, so it's halfway through the pandemic and is like, uh, you know, um, half, um, six months for, you know, pre-pandemic and uh, six months uh, post-pandemic. So, uh, we, I, I don't, 
I can't say anything that in, in relation to the uh, situations that COVID created, but uh, I think flexible working brings some opportunities for disabled people in general. And uh, more people are working from home where they are feeling more safe and secure. And uh, this is uh, mostly, most of the disabled people are shielding for a long time now. And if the opportunity were given to them and uh, working from their home, then they contribute to the economy. This is like actually probably, you know, as I mentioned, this is the only positive thing that we can say about this pandemic perhaps, because, you know, when you give the opportunity to people, they can contribute to uh, to the economy. But I, I'm, I'm not very, um, I mean, the data doesn't show why there's a big difference between disabled men and women, but we know that um, men are more affected by COVID also. So uh, this is more medical research. So I don't know, you know, if, if it affected their employ employability levels and so on. So um, yeah, I, I can only answer from that line, I suppose, to that question. But thank you, Meg, for raising that point. I think it, it might reflect the, as the latest stats showed, on the additional uh, care and responsibilities that women cite that are likely to impact their economic activity rates, and that, that's likely to be a factor for all women, including those with disabilities. Thank you for that, both. Um, the next question we have is from Maya Rees, who asks, looking at the very low public appointments of women this year, could the extra responsibilities women have had to take on this year, e.g. homeschooling, have had an impact on them wishing to take on extra responsibilities? Or could this be that existing networks, which are male dominated, have been used to fill positions in a challenging climate? Um, Karis, did you want to take that question? Yeah, I think that's very perceptive. Um, and I think that the, the, probably some of what you said is, is absolutely right. And um, we know that there are has been real effort over the last couple of years to increase women in public appointments and and so of course we'll be picking up those conversations with our government and others um anecdotally through the conversations that we have with with um with many women that is a factor that they're saying on top of everything else this is just not the year that i could look to take that and also um you know we've highlighted in committee evidence and um, previously that there is a risk from the way that we're all having to work at the moment that women will be last back to work because we're also doing the caring and the homeschooling and men are more likely to be going back to work more quickly and that could have a long-term impact on both things like public appointments but long-term career outcomes for for women Hade, do you have anything to add to that um the public appointment figures are quite um as stark this year, but the number of public appointments are not actually that much also. So, um, you know, when you are uh, converted to percentages, it, say, it seems more stark, but um, uh, the number of appointments are not that uh, high either. So I want to just highlight that 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 there. But um, this year, um, it's very unprecedented. So we actually don't know what's happening in the, <laughs> in the, in the public level also that much. You know, there are lots of reactionary responses are taken and there are very quick pace appointments may be happening and so on. So again, you know, we will see the impact of uh, the, the important thing is if it is going to be a trend or if it is just a reaction to, to COVID this year. So I think we have to keep a close eye on, on these figures uh, regardless of how many appointments were did, but we have to keep an eye on the, on the figures. I think. Thank you. So we have another question um, from Rachel Bone, who asks, what role can skills and training play in delivering an, econ in, in delivering an economy, oh, I can't say that word today, <laughs> that works for women, for all women? Did you get that or did you need to repeat it? Yeah, that's so fine. What... Thanks, Susie. And um, I think I touched upon that in talking about our manifesto asks. We, we it's very stark if you look at the subject choices and the attrition rates by different subject choices of, of girls and boys and men and women as they develop through their career. Um, and I think there's a role for all education providers in addressing those gender stereotypes. Won't come as any surprise to you, Rachel, because I've said it a million times before. I think we ought to have quotas in things like apprenticeships to ensure that 
providers are actually taking action to um, address the barriers that, that girls face to entry to different subjects. And, and that matters because if we look at, if you just take apprenticeships and look at the, the different start rates on, on say, um, public sector courses, um, health, social care, hair and beauty compared to um, more of the STEM subjects, you know, the figures are pretty, pretty shocking in terms of the difference of girls and boys on those course starts. But also those have long term consequences on their career earnings over a lifetime. And that directly contributes to the gender pay gap. But it's also true at an undergraduate and postgraduate level. If you look at the number of undergraduate females studying computer science, that is falling and has been falling consistently for a number of years. Um, and so it's not just about the old fashioned, if you like, or so-called old fashioned industries that we think are traditionally male dominated. We're allowing these gender stereotypes to permeate into what some of the industries of the future will be. And, and there's a real onus on all of us as parents, but all of us who have an interest in schools, colleges, universities to, to tackle that and to call it out. Ade, did you have anything to add to that question? Mm. Um, just, um, I agree with everything that Kerry said. And um, I think um, with the um, rapid changes in labour markets, um, at the moment, skills and training become much more important. So we have to look at new ways of working uh, in new sectors more. Uh, and also we are talking about, um, as you know, climate emergency and so on. We have, so we have to create new uh, approach to labor market as well. So skills and training will be much more ce uh, central in the coming days. And we have to assure, reassure that uh, gender equality uh, will be there uh, from the very beginning, and um, that is that is the key thing to monitor in the coming years. And I think there's a there's a real risk going into any recession that you know patterns of behaviour in a recession environment are repeated, and we know that often training budgets are the first to be cut. Um, and you know we're calling very strongly on employers to to not do that. That's not the time to disinvest from from training and development, but also in our manifesto, we call for a significant increase in investment in lifelong learning because people are going to need new and different opportunities to change careers, to, to reskill, um, and if they're going to stay in the labour market for the long term. Thank you. So we have another question from Seth Stephanie Howarth, who asks, what changes do you think are needed to data analysis um, in order to better monitor the impact of the pandemic on women in a timely way. She also said, great presentation, thank you. Um, um, Hardy, I'll, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you like the presentation. It's, it's, it's a bit difficult one to present, to be honest, with lots of uh, terminology and numbers and so on. But yeah, I hope you're not bored. <laughs> but um, what data analysis we need? In Core Tech, we always said that we need um, gender breakdown in every single figure and also we are pushing for more intersectional data we need to know the details of what's happening and we had a, um, a great progress in wales actually uh, during the gender equality review um, um uh, stakeholder events and so on we we uh, constantly were in touch with start wales Welsh government statistical services and so on and they understand our needs and they try to find new ways to um, and produce more uh, detailed data, particularly looking from intersectional level and seeing the um, seeing the um, different um, 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 characteristics clashing with each other and so on. So uh, I think this is quite important. And um, one of the excuses for um, um, lack of intersectional data is uh, small sample size. So um, if they can over, um, overcome this problem, like looking to um, um, produce data from different perspectives, then I think we will have more better analysis in data, which would be uh, very useful for us because um, I think um, one of the other things that probably COVID uh, uh, positively impact our society, we know now that data is so important. If you don't know the evidence, you can't produce an effective policy. That is so simple. 
and we see that you know data is the most crucial thing now taking the policy actions by any government in the UK and we see that uh, if the data is not good then we are falling into the into more deeper crisis so um, we have to be really very careful about data and we have to make data transparent and accessible to uh, wider society so um, I think you know on top of my head I can say this one but yeah, Karis, I mean, I don't know if you want to add more on this. Yeah, the only thing I would add, I agree with everything that you said, is that when we talk about data, um, I think this is one of the things that Welsh Government reflected back to us as part of the Gender Equality Review. They sort of put their hands up and said, well, we're great at collecting lots of data, but sometimes we don't really get enough time um, or expertise to do the analysis. Um, and there's no point really in collecting the data if, if you can't do the analysis so there's there's work i think for all of us to do in organizations not just in government or public sector to think about capacity and expertise to to really analyze and understand things and and make changes off the back of that another thing i would say about data um and hardy has said has said you know sometimes sample size is used as a bit of an excuse um, we pushed very strongly in the gender equality review that there are other ways to to collect data or to do analysis and and that needs to get be um that needs to include having the right balance between quantitative data and qualitative data but also taking into account people's lived experience and and putting that at the heart of um both policy that we make and how we implement it and and i think you know we will continue to have to keep pushing this so just to give you one current example um when the economic support packages were announced for businesses as a result of closure around covid you know we highlighted that we were not businesses were not being asked to provide any data about the number of men and women um, who owned those businesses number of men and women who were employed um, and therefore we couldn't really look at uh, the impact or the benefit that was being received from that support package by welsh government and, and that matters because the last time we were in a recession and big support package was put in place, it was found that actually men benefited more than women. And so it's just about continuing to make the point that asking those questions, collecting the data, but also doing the analysis is really important. Thank you for that. We've just got a couple of more. So I will um, ask them just because I think it would be nice for everyone to have their questions answered. Um, the next one comes from Larry Williams, who's a change analyst at the Office of Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. They ask, what one change would you prioritise to ensure a gender equal Wales for future generations? That's tough. <laughs> I know, how can you pick one? <laughs> I, I, think, I think in the, um, the, the vision and the definitions that were accepted by Welsh Government um, and the recommendations of the Gender Equality Review, there was a potentially important shift recognised and accepted and, and we need to keep pushing it. And that is that creating equality of opportunity is not enough. You've got to foreground thinking about inequality and you know, from our perspective, gender equality at the beginning of decision making. And if your policy intervention, funding part, whatever it is, doesn't actively reduce inequality, then we shouldn't be doing it. And that has been accepted by Welsh Government, but I think too often we just fall into poor back patterns of, of behaviour. If actually everybody could mainstream that concept um, in their minds, then whatever we do, and wherever we work, um, and however we can do something in our everyday life to reduce gender equality would be more effective. So that focus on what is the equality of outcome rather than the opportunity? What do you think, Hardy? It's a difficult question. I mean, there are lots of areas, so I'm going to be cheeky and uh, I'm going to cover them uh, all by saying that I think the most important change will be um, a feminist government. So, <laughs> if we, uh, Welsh government uh, pledged to be a feminist government. So there are lots of steps taken, and as we mentioned, gender equality review was carried out by Quartec with the uh, contribution of many stakeholders, and so we are uh, progressing on that level up. But if we want to, if if Wales become a fully feminist government, we will uh, we will take lots of actions towards gender equality. 
properly and legislation legislatively so um i think this is uh, this is a quite important process and progress and uh, if we all support um uh, um, feminist government and um, try to contribute to the future actions of Bash government. And if we all um, accept uh, feminism for everyone, because feminism is not only for gender equality, it's, it's the equality of everyone. Uh, and if we if we um, kind of uh, promote feminism as a um, as an overarching uh, approach to uh, how we are structuring the um the society i think that will be a great change for future generations thank you for that so just two more questions before we close um this one comes from our colleague scott edwards um from quieter who asks where the gender pay gap has closed are we able to tell whether this is an uplift in the women's amount or depression in the males due to covid or both mm -hmm. Paddy, you can take that, I think. <laughs> um, gender pay gap is actually not as that simple as it seems, first of all. So we have um, gender pay gap figures include lots of structural problems. So we can't just say that, you know, one benefit and the other one is failing and so on. This is this is a very complex picture. And um, and um, I'm um, very uh, happy to say that uh, we are also uh, a partner in an academic research at the moment, a PhD student in Cardiff University Economics Department, Susanna, is uh, carrying out a research about uh, gender pay gap in, in Wales and looking at these structural, uh, structural issues. So um, the, um, the, 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 the gaps in uh, the pay, gender pay gap is uh, actually covering all the sectors, but we can't just know which sectors are most contributing to gender pay gap, which, which are uh, less contributing and which are dominated by men and women and so on. So there are lots of different um, in indicators that um, uh, determine gender pay gap. Um, so in that sense, it is difficult to just measure one or the other. Uh, but um, if we if we achieve gender equality in in sectors, occupations, and uh, in the pay. So that will be, you know, but th this is going to be a benefit for everyone. This is, you know. And Hardy will remember this is something we thought very carefully about when discussing what measures we should capture in this report. And we've stuck to the same measures over the, the past three years. And if you look at the gender pay gap, as, as Hardy says, it is, it is quite complex. And also the figures are, are pretty volatile because they might be affected by a significant employer in one local authority area, for example, or they might be, as your question indicates, um, uh, affected by a depression of wages as much as an increase. But um, that's exactly why we not only look at the overall levels of pay, but we look at gender segregation by sectors and industries. It's why we look at caring responsibilities, because unequal sharing of caring is a major in, uh, influence on gender pay. So it, it's important that we see, yes, the overall headline figures, and we want to see that trend continue, but we need to look at the nuance around that. Thank you for that, Beau. Um, and then the final question for this session is, is there any, um, sorry, this question comes from Kay Smith, who asks, is there any view on the per personal learning accounts that are currently already in place? And well, I think that's in terms uh, of training and development. Hi Kay. <laughs> Kay and I used to work together a long time ago. Um, good question. Personal learning accounts was uh, chosen by Welsh Government to pilot gender budgeting. Um, to be totally frank, I'm not sure how effective that's been because they chose quite interesting sectors, shall we say, which weren't necessarily lending themselves that well to, to that gendered analysis. Um, I think that is concept, the flexibility, and so the, as I understand it, um, and it's been a while since we talked about this, Kay, in previous lifelong learning background, um, but the flexibility that they offer to support people's individual needs should be a, a leveller uh, for, for women. Um, I think at the moment, take up is still pretty low, um, but perhaps that's a conversation we could pick up to see whether there's work that Quarotech could do to support the Learning Work Institute on that front. 
Tade, did you have everything, anything to add? Um, 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 I think um, personal learning is quite important if you also think about intersectionality because everyone is coming from different backgrounds and this is why we are stressing on um, on intersectionality. You know, for example, a disabled people um, who are uh, in need of different um, working environment and uh, wants to work in different um, areas and so on, the personal learning probably much better opportunity for them. So um, it, it, we have to we have to look when we are developing programs. I think we have to look at um, different segments of the society and who is going to benefit and who can increase their uh, increase their opportunity by um, applying these programs and so on. And I think personal learning might be uh, counted in one of those areas. Uh, thank you both for answering those questions and thank you to everyone who's tuned in today and to those who've submitted questions. I think this has been a really insightful and informative session. Um, after this session, there will be a link to review this um, on YouTube. So if you wanted to go back to anything or if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to email myself, Hade or Karis or anyone from the policy and research team. Um, so yeah, just thanks again to Karis and Hade for presenting the findings of the report and thank you to you all for tuning in. I'm going to close the, this um, broadcast now. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye.